Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight, an explosion at a South Austin apartment building leaves eight people hurt. The latest on the investigation. We have a serious shortage of judges. Elections officials hope to head off a crisis before the November elections. When corporations are making decisions about how much risk to impose on the communities in which they operate, it should be zero. A jury orders medical tool sterilization company Sterigenics to pay millions for decades of toxic air pollution. We can't kick this can down the road any longer. Bold words, but so far data shows empty promises from Mayor Lightfoot on lead service line replacements. A new study finds people with HIV are disproportionately contracting monkeypox, what pu public health officials can do. Black workers are overrepresented in low-wage jobs, according to a new report. A closer look at the pay gap. Not too sweet, not too savory, it's soft in the middle, and then just taste of freshness. And a little village native is bringing something new to 26th Street by making a sweet treat the old-fashioned way. But first, some of today's top stories. Federal prosecutors are charging Democratic State Senator Emil Jones III with three felonies. The government alleges Jones took a $5,000 bribe from a firm that installed red light cameras throughout the state. Also, that he lied to FBI agents. Jones is the latest to be charged in a probe into whether elected officials accepted bribes as part of a push to install red light cameras in the city and suburbs. At least eight people are injured following an explosion at a building in South Austin this morning. Deputy Fire Commissioner Mark Furman says the victims suffered everything from burns to traumatic injuries. At least three of those victims are in serious to critical condition. Officials say the cause of the explosion is still under investigation, and we'll have much more on this in just a moment. Local leaders are urging folks to help residents of Puerto Rico get relief from the devastating effects of Hurricane Fiona. Co-chair of the Puerto Rican Agenda of Chicago, Jesse Fuente, says the organization will be rekindling its campaign to help rebuild, rescue, and provide relief for the embattled island. People of Puerto Rico need our support. They need our solidarity. But more importantly, they need the money. The Category 3 storm has left residents of Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic with catastrophic flooding, power failures, and landslides. And up next, more details about the explosion this morning in Chicago's Austin community. So please stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Eight people are in the hospital this evening after receiving injuries, some critical, during a building explosion in the South Austin neighborhood. The explosion collapsed to the fourth floor of an apartment building at Central and West End. Fire officials are still investigating what caused the blast, while dozens of people who live in the area collapse zone are left trying to figure out what's next. Here to talk about the latest in the investigation and how agencies are stepping up to help are Joy Squire, Chief Communications Officer for the American Red Cross Illinois Region, Chicago Deputy Fire Commissioner Cynthia Herring, and 29th Ward Alderman Chris Taliaferro. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Alderman, let's start with you, please. Uh, what can you tell us? What do we know about the status of uh, the survivors and their injuries tonight? Um, I've been informed by our, our Chicago Fire Department um, that we have approximately eight people uh, that have been injured. Um, some more serious than others. And um, I am very thankful and grateful that um, that there are no fatalities that I believe as of this point. Okay, and we know that uh, those, those people have been taken to multiple area hospitals uh, for care. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, what is the status of the building right now? Uh, the building is currently uh, still being, uh, in the, it's being investigated for the cause of this problem. And so we're working with uh, the police department and ATF and other agencies to determine what the cause is. So there's, there's nothing, uh, con there's no conclusion at this time as to what, the, what happened. And, and when, when firefighters are call, called to a scene like that, what are some of the first steps they need to take uh, to make sure that people are safe? 
Well, the original call came in as a still alarm, which was immediately escalated upon the first battalion chief arriving and seeing that the top of the building was exploded as he reported. Uh, so immediately that uh, caused us to uh, escalate the alarm to a still in box and also asked for an EMS plan one, given the, given the uh, propensity of what the occupancy was, how many people were possibly in the building. So we had an initial five ambulances and it was again, later escalated to an EMS plan two, which gives us 10 ambulances at the scene uh, to address the, the initial rescues and transport of those injured. Um, Joy, what, are, what is it that the, the American Red Cross is doing right now for the people who live in the building and uh, those who live in the area and have been displaced? Well, at the Red Cross, our hearts go out to those that have been impacted by this tragic disaster. And that's what that is, this explosion really is. It's an emergency and the Red Cross responds to emergencies. So today we set up at a local church in Austin at the Circle Union Ministries Church, um, a reunification center for families. We have a shelter there this evening. We've been providing food, shelter, disaster mental health counseling, health services support, which means if you need medication replacement or medical device replacement, like a walker or a cane will help you. And we're there helping people think about um, how they can eventually move toward recovery. So our volunteers are on site right now at that church. And we're grateful to that church and the Austin community for allowing us to be there. Deputy Commissioner, we also reference what's called the called the collapse zone. Uh, how would you describe uh, how broad that is and, and what's included and what it means for the folks who live within that area? Uh, we established a collapse zone for the safety of, of our, our first responders, as well as those persons that are uh, being uh, removed from the building and the adjacent building, we also had to evacuate. So we just want to make sure that we establish that collapse zone in case there's a secondary collapse, that we uh, put no one at risk for further injury and we put none of our members at risk for further injury or injury at all. How broad or how, how wide would you say that area is? Uh, generally, we look you know, two and a half times the height of the building will give us uh, a sufficient amount of collapse room in case there's a secondary collapse and that it'll keep uh, everyone out of harm's way. Alderman Talia Farrow, what do we know about this building? Well, uh, you know, the only reports that I've received with regard to the building is, you know, um, other than a few inspections that have been failed um, uh, previously, I, I believe uh, in 2020, uh, there have been no major complaints, it's especially there have been none uh, made with my office. Um, however, I do believe that the Department of Building have reported that uh, there were some inspection failures as well as, as well as um, complaints made by some of the residents within the facility, uh, within the building. Alderman, what are some of the other agencies that you've been in touch with? Uh, because, of course, there's been speculation about whether or not uh, gas is related to this. Have you heard from, uh, from ComEd on this? Well, I've, I've heard from people's gas, and I do understand that um, uh, that ATF is, is on the scene as well. Um, but I, I particularly, Brandy, want, want to thank uh, the American Red Cross, the Chicago Police Department, Chicago Fire Department, um, the community organizations that came out to the scene, our, our faith-based uh, faith leadership, and uh, our other elected officials that have all um, are, are trying to bring resources to the community uh, so that those that are injured and displaced um, can have a, a, a time of transition that whereby the, the community can provide resources to them. So I do want to uh, particularly thank all of those organizations that are really stepping up and showing uh, the city that Austin supports them. And of course, people's gas, not comment. I misspoke earlier. Uh, meanwhile, mm -hmm. Alderman, what are you hearing from uh, your residents and neighbors in that area? But this is this is going to be long term recovery uh, for the residents in the, in the building, um, you know, particularly even one young lady that's, that lives in the building um, told me that everything that she has um, is was in within that building. Uh, she even left out without her cell phone. And so um, this is this is going to be a long term recovery for a lot of the families. Um, I believe it's a 35 unit building. So uh, you have quite a few families that are going to be displaced and that are going to be affected. Um, over the next several months to even even beyond a year um, to be able to recover from uh, what they've experienced today. 
Joy Squire, uh, you know, we just heard the alderman say this is going to be a long-term recovery, uh, and obviously your organization is providing some of those immediate needs for folks right now. Um, but what other resources are they going to need going forward, and, and what's next for them? You know, the Red Cross is there along with other organizations, and we're there to help the community as, as long as need be. Um, we'll probably set up a multi-agency resource center is what we call, you know, a longer term facility where people can come and get resources from a variety of organizations and groups. We're there working with the aldermen, working with um, Cook County, the Chicago Fire Department, Chicago Police Department, and other organizations on helping people figure out what's next. The Red Cross responds in emergencies, and this is an emergency. You can't recover overnight, and we're gonna be there helping the community. Um, Commissioner, we just talked about, you know, the, the area around the building, that collapse zone. Um, what needs to happen in order for you all to lift that and folks uh, to be able to return to homes that were not uh, necessarily um, uh, damaged in the same way? Our primary concern is to make sure that we rescue, find, and remove any victims. Uh, and then we begin our systematic searches to uh, see if there's any remaining victims and then see the extent of the damage and then begin the process of uh, shoring uh, those floors where the uh, most extensive damage occurred to ensure that the building is safe enough to enter and we can continue with our ongoing investigation as to what happened and why it happened and how it happened. Uh, and again, working with other agencies to determine that is our primary focus and goal. And just to be clear, Deputy Commissioner, do you believe that there are any other victims to be found, or is your department confident that that part is, is done? We're confident that we removed every victim and every person, not only in the uh, collapsed building, but even the adjacent build building was also evacuated to ensure that all persons were out of any uh, harm's way or are not in any danger uh, that could occur if, the, if there were a secondary collapse. So, yes, we're confident that we removed and, set and rescued all, all persons. Understood. Uh, best of luck to the three of you in the work that lies ahead. Thank you for joining us. 29th Ward Alderman Chris Taliaferro, Deputy Fire Commissioner Cynthia Herring, and Joy Squire at American Red Cross. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you. Thank you. It's easier than ever to participate in an Illinois election with vote by mail as a permanent option and other early voting opportunities also available. But election officials say some parts of running the election are harder like finding volunteers who help make it all go smoothly. Amanda Vinicky joins us now with more. Amanda, what seems to be the problem? Brenda, it's not just a problem, but according to Cook County Clerk Karen Yarbrough, a potential crisis. We have a serious shortage of judges and poll walk workers. Now, the clerk's office manages elections in suburban Cook County, and we've seen our number of election judges shrink significantly in recent years. Over the last eight years, we've seen a reduction of about 40%. Gabro says about 4,000 people have told the clerk's office that they'll be able to help out on November 8th, but they need about 7,000. Gabro says the pandemic has hindered her office's ability to recruit election judges and poll watchers. Also, she suspects many may be retiring given that the average age is between 65 and 70 years old. She says the political climate isn't helping. A report from the nonpartisan Brennan Center for Justice issued last summer found that increasingly election officials are under attack of violent threats, also pressure to prioritize partisanship over a fair election process, and that, that has been made all the more difficult by an unsustainable workload and the spread of disinformation. Now, David Becker is the founder and the director of the nonpartisan Center for Election in innovation and research. He's also out fresh today, co-authoring a new book, The Big Truth, Upholding Democracy in the Age of the Big Lie. And if we get to the point where we cannot believe or do not believe that elections are valid, that they have integrity, despite the fact that we have more secure elections than ever right now, we're in a very dangerous place as a democracy. Is there a way to put that genie back in the bottle? It's going to take a long time. I, we, we're very clear-eyed about the damage that's been done. 
And that damage is not just here in Cook County or even mostly here. Clark Yarbrough actually says that she's unaware of suburban Cook County judges having faced that sort of harassment and vitriol. But Becker says with paper ballots, audits, additional judicial scrutiny, elections are more secure and yet nationally lies about the election have led to harassment, abuse, even death threats of election officials. Now, given that Becker says that he doesn't blame folks for not wanting to serve as election judges or as poll watchers, but he says when there are these major elections and 2020 saw a record turnout of nearly 160 million voters, he says the system relies on these volunteers not only worth it, it's more crucial than ever, this kind of active citizenship to go in there, to see the process, to learn about the process, to, to facilitate your fellow Americans' votes, even if you disagree with them. And then to be an evangelist for that process afterwards so that we can have a peaceful transfer of power. Now, one of those election judges, Harriet Holmes, she's actually performed that duty for some 40 years. And she says that if enough people don't show up on election day, well, it makes the job difficult. It is a burden when you have a place where you should have five judges and you only have three. And we are running around trying to get things done. We want things done in a proper manner. That's why we signed on to be judges. So when we don't have that, we do double work. And so we're looking for people to come out, to stand up, to serve, to do what we need to be done in order for us to move democracy and move our world in the place where we need to go to. Chicago, in fact, did experience a shortage of election judges for the June 28th primary, such that some polling places were delayed in opening. Now, suburban Cook County trying something new to attract recruits to the cause. The clerk's office says it is going to be reaching out to veterans organizations and will ask those who served in the military to perform another patriotic duty. So these are tough times for democracy. And those in the veterans community um, took many years out of their lives to fight for this democracy. And we're asking for them to fight for this democracy again by serving us on election day. Cook County clerk's officials are searching for thousands more judges, even though there will be fewer precincts starting this midterm election in accordance with the state law that allows precinct boundaries to expand. We did reduce the amount of precincts to kind of keep up with some of the shortages, but it's still, um, it's still difficult. Now, the Chicago Board of Elections says that due to that precinct consolidation, it is going to need about 6,450 judges rather than the current 10,345. A spokesperson says that that drop is going to allow polling places to actually be overstaffed, at least that's the hope, with six to seven judges rather than the typical target of five. And that Chicago is in fact already close to hitting that goal and also having better luck recruiting bilingual judges to serve. If you are wanting to step up for that, there are still opportunities again with Cook County, but also with the city of Chicago. And I have been using by the way, the word volunteer when talking about these recruits. But in fact, this is a paid position for the day anyway. With that, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And now to Paris with more on a bombshell verdict. Paris. Brandis, some residents of suburban Willowbrook are breathing a sigh of relief. This after a Cook County jury awards $363 million in damages from the medical tool sterilization company called Sterigenics. The company's Willowbrook facility was closed in 2019, months after an EPA report discovered people living within 1.5 miles of the plant were 10 times more likely to develop cancer. The plaintiff in this case, Sue Kamuda, was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2007. The company is facing hundreds of more lawsuits. And joining us now with more are Patrick Salvi, Jr., managing partner of Salvi, Showstock, and Pritchard's Chicago office. He represented Sue Kamuda. Sue Kamuda, the plaintiff in the first case against Sterigenics, and Ursula Tanaway, member of the group Stop Sterigenics. And we did reach out to Sterigenics for a statement, which we will get to shortly. But first, I welcome all of you to uh, Chicago tonight. Uh, Sue, congratulations to you. I know this has been a very long four years. Uh, what was your initial reaction when you heard this record verdict? Uh, well, uh, Pat and Jen, two of, the, two of um, uh, the attorneys were sitting next to me and holding my hand that I literally i just felt myself shaking it was 
more than um, I could have expected. And Sue, take us back. You first were diagnosed in 2007. There's been a lot of back and forth in terms of the regulatory environment with ethylene oxide. When did you first discover uh, that there was a link to what you were breathing in and your breast cancer? I, I didn't know for years. I, a neighbor stopped me um, when they found out about it, when the report came out and uh, uh, said that there was going to be a meeting and that there was, an, I didn't know what ethylene oxide was at that time. At, and and um, that was the first time I'd ever heard of it or, and I'd never thought of it, of course. And uh, Ursula, you, you formed this group, Stop Serogenics and Willowbrook. The, the first known uh, study that, that there might be a link between ethylene oxide and cancer was in 2004. Sterogenics didn't shut down until 2019. Why did this fight take so long? A lot of it was community awareness. Um, there were some newspaper articles that we dug up after we found out about it as a community uh, that were dated earlier, but the vast majority of us did were not paying attention or it just didn't get the news coverage that would have caught our attention until 2018. Um, we had some of our group members who were very attuned to local politics and local municipal government that noticed that the ATSDR report was on the village website. And once that was there, they started to distribute it. And a lot of us got involved and got together in a room and decided that we would take our stand here. Um, so there were, there were many of us who were concerned from day one and got together. And of course, later the rates of cancer found not only in Willowbrook, but uh, Hinsdale and Burr Ridge and other surrounding communities uh, was startling. Uh, Patrick Selvey, uh, tell us about that. Uh, what what these studies found about the rates of cancer in those communities? Sure. Well, I, <clears throat> Paris, I think what you're referring to when you use that figure nine or ten times uh, higher cancer risk, uh, that came from the conclusion from the EPA in 2016 through an IRIS report that identified what's called an inhalation unit risk factor for ethylene oxide, essentially determining its potency. And then when you compare the Willowbrook area uh, based on the amount of emissions that were coming from sterogenics to other places in the country, it literally ranked in the top 25 among census tracts, the two tracks closest to the Willowbrook facility uh, in the top 25 of census tracts in terms of cancer risk out of over 77,000 census tracts in the country. So that was a risk analysis. Uh, in terms of an ecological study that was done in the area, for example, Sue's cancer, breast cancer, uh, it was determined that there was a statistically significant increase in breast cancer uh, in the what's called an ecological study when they looked at cancer rates between 95 and 2015. That was evidence in the case as well. So clearly there's too much cancer in the area and that's why we've brought these lawsuits and fortunately we're successful in the first one yesterday. Indeed, Sterogenics, uh, we did ask them to come on the show. They responded with a comment on the verdict saying, quote, we do not believe the jury verdict in this matter reflects the evidence presented in court. Sterogenics is evaluating the verdict and plans to challenge this decision through all appropriate processes, including appeals. Uh, Patrick is a lead attorney on this case. Do you anticipate uh, this company will make a quick appeal of this ruling? Sure. So the legal process starts with what's called a post-trial motion in front of the trial judge. Uh, that's going to be due by the end of October, uh, and we should have a ruling hopefully by the end of November. Uh, it'll somewhat depend on the judge's schedule. From there, it goes to the appeal process. Uh, but there are two trials that are waiting in the wings. So there's one that starts soon. There's another one that starts about a month after that. November, December will probably be the third trial. Uh, and the evidence is going to be uh, very similar. Uh, a lot of it will be the same. Uh, and so uh, we believe that the defendants really ought to wise up and, uh, and come to the table, potentially try to resolve these cases. But we'll see what they do. If they want to go through the appeal, uh, that brings its own risks uh, in terms of the 9% post-judgment interest on the $363 million verdict. Uh, and this is a fairly large corporation that uh, can pay those kinds of fees. So we'll see what happens. Uh, to have a judgment is not only satisfying, but it really puts the plaintiffs in these lawsuits in the driver's seat, which is where they belong after what's happened to them. Sue, so, you know, part of the evidence here was the fact that there had been no uh, history of, of breast cancer in your family. And of course, this link between ethylene oxide and, and cancer. Uh, when did you decide that, that you wanted to take this big company on? 
I really did it just to get them to stop and get out of our neighborhood. Uh, you know, I encouraged other people that, you know, came forward and told me about their cancers. And I, I encouraged everybody to get on just so we can, we could get them out. I didn't know I was going to be the first case. And I didn't know it was going to be over four years before we had this judgment. A very long fight. And uh, Ursula, you know, Sterogenics still does have other facilities. Uh, and, and by the way, I should mention, you know, the ethylene oxide was a byproduct of them sterilizing uh, medical equipment. And it's, it was coming out of that, uh, that, that little shoot that they had uh, before they shut down. But there are other facilities. There's another company, Medline in Waukegan, releasing high le levels of ethylene oxide. Uh, what is next for the Stop Sterogenics movement as it relates to those facilities? Well, there's... Um we've done pretty much what we can at the Illinois state level, or that's how we feel about it um, as an organization. We do have more work to do at the federal level, which is the next place where we can have the most influence and in gathering other communities like ours and getting them activated and organized and sharing our information and our experience so they can hit the ground running. So they don't have to go through the learning curve that we had to go through when we had to find out, you know, what is ethylene oxide? How is it regulated? What agencies are involved that we have to get in contact with? Um, if we can get them a running start on that process, they can, you know, go through this process faster. Um, but yes, we plan to continue to lobby as private citizens and as an organization um, to get more stringent requirements of these companies. Um, there's no there's no uh, idea in our mind that we're going to be able to get rid of ethylene oxide altogether. But for example, there's this narrative that it is used for sterilizing medical devices, and that just doesn't capture uh, the breadth of how it, this chemical is used. For example, it's used on food. And I think we can all agree that it is misused when it's used on food uh, because we have other ways to ensure that our food is safe to eat. So, so more education perhaps uh, needing to be done on ethylene oxide in the ways that it's used. Uh, uh, but for now, our thanks to Patrick Selvi, Jr., Sue Kamuda, and Ursula Tanaway. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. And we're back with more right after this. Much of the story of Latinos in America is that of entrepreneurship. About 5 million Latino-owned businesses currently exist in the U.S. Predominantly Latino communities often bear the environmental burden of heavy industry. Residents of those communities say they have a hard time making their concerns hurt. A Chicago-based photographer has a personal understanding of immigration, and he has spent years documenting small businesses. The forces of gentrification can make people being priced out of their neighborhoods feel powerless. But the founders of Lolita's Bodega say residents have more power than they think. Still to come on Chicago tonight, crews have replaced less than 0.5% of lead service lines in Chicago homes in the past two years, according to city data. What's the holdup? People with HIV are disproportionately contracting monkeypox. We hear how public health officials can address the disparity. Low-wage workers are making up an increasing portion of America's workforce. And in Chicago, a disproportionate share of those workers are black. Not too sweet, not too savory, but soft in the middle, and then just taste the freshness. And a little village native is making a sweet treat the old-fashioned way. But first, some more of today's top stories. An off-duty police officer was shot on the northwest side in what Chicago Police Superintendent David Brown calls a road rage incident. The shooting occurred at the intersection of Addison and Elston. There was also a police presence near Lawrence and the Kennedy Expressway. Police don't have any, anyone in custody, but describe the suspect's vehicle as a black SUV. The off-duty officer was wounded in the face with non-life-threatening injuries. I did talk to the officer, uh, and she is talking. She is, she is apparently did not lose consciousness, so thank goodness uh, that she's uh, going to be able to... Uh, you recover from these injuries. The Civilian Oversight Agency tasked with investigating police misconduct released video of a July shooting in Pilsen that led to two Chicago police officials being arrested on felony charges. The Civilian Office of Police Accountability released multiple surveillance and body cam videos from the July 22nd shooting that left an unarmed man seriously injured. 
Last week, the Cook County State's Attorney charged the two CPD officials with aggravated battery with a firearm, aggravated discharge of a firearm, and official misconduct. A new report estimates more than 65,000 people experienced homelessness in Chicago in 2020. That number gathered by the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless accounts for people who are sheltered, unsheltered, and those temporarily staying with others. The report finds that the Department of Housing and Urban Development's current definition of homelessness fails to account for people temporarily staying with others, which is the way most people experience homelessness in Illinois. It also finds that homelessness continues to disproportionately impact black Chicagoans. More than two years ago, Mayor Lori Lightfoot declared it was, quote, way past time for city officials to start removing lead service lines. The lines can leach a brain damaging chemical into the water Chicagoans use to drink, bathe and cook. But since then, city crews have removed less than one half of one percent of the 400,000 lines in the city. And there's no plan to pick up the pace. WTTW News reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with what that means for efforts to ensure Chicagoans have clean water in their homes. Heather, remind us how Chicago came to have more lead service lines than any other American city uh, and what Mayor Lightfoot promised to do about it. Well, until 1985, Chicago homes had to be connected to water mains via lead service lines. Now, after federal officials banned the use of lead because it could contaminate drinking waters, officials stopped. But at no point did city officials take responsibility for changing out those potentially dangerous pipes until September 2020, when Mayor Lori Lightfoot said it should be the city's responsibility to remove those pipes in especially low income and moderate income neighborhoods. And she said she'd get started with $15 million from the federal government and focus on 650 homes in Chicago's poorest neighborhoods. And since that promise, how many of those lead service lines have been removed? Well, a total of 188 have been removed, but only 154 in those low income neighborhoods I mentioned. That is the less than one half of 1% of all of the lead service lines in Chicago. The remaining 34 lines were paid for by property owners who covered the total cost, but the city waived the fees. So despite that slow pace, though, Lightfoot spoke uh, to a gathering of mayors last week. She highlighted her push to remove the lead service lines. Here's a little bit of what she said. I became the first Chicago mayor in history to say enough is enough, that we can't kick this can down the road any longer, and we must be committed to achieving water equity by replacing all of these lead service lines. Heather, did she at all acknowledge that her administration has not been able to fulfill those promises? Well, she told her fellow mayors that it was, quote, easier said than done, unquote, to remove these lead service lines. But she declined to answer my questions about why the city had fallen so, sh fallen so short of fulfilling the promises that she made and what the plan was moving forward. Now, you mentioned a little bit of money, and we all know that removing these lead service lines can be really expensive. Is that what's holding up the push? Well, it costs between $15,000 and $26,000 to remove each lead service line, in part because Chicago is such a dense urban environment. But the city not only has that initial grant money that it's been hanging on to since 2020, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that passed in November 2021 included $15 billion to remove lead service lines, and Chicago will be in line for its fair share of that hot if city officials can figure out how to get this program off the ground once and for all. Okay. A lot of work uh, remains, it sounds like, Heather Sharon. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Heather's full story on our website. It's all at WTTW.com slash news. And now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. Researchers have found that the monkeypox virus is disproportionately affecting people with HIV. A recent study from the CDC finds that in a sample of nearly 2,000 people who had monkeypox, 38% had HIV infection and 41% had an STI in the preceding year. Those rates are much higher than the general rates of HIV and STI in the general population. And joining us now with more is Dr. Aniruddha Hazra, Assistant Professor in a Section of Infectious Disease and Global Health 
Health at U Chicago Medicine. Dr. Hazra, welcome back uh, as always. So what is behind this disproportionate impact of monkeypox in those that are HIV positive or have STDs? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I feel like we have uh, seen sort of uh, certain groups of people disproportionately impacted by the monkeypox outbreak, specifically gay, bisexual, and of men, and within that population, specifically those who had uh, potentially recent STIs and as well as people living with HIV. Uh, this isn't very surprising, uh, really. This has been data that we have seen uh, as the outbreak had been sort of percolating in Europe and Canada uh, and seeing sort of similar data here in the United States. And there's a few theories as to why. I mean, uh, expand on those. Yeah, I think the biggest um, uh, uh, draw from the most recent um, uh, study from the CDC showed that people living with HIV uh, comprise of nearly double the amount of, uh, of hospitalizations than those without HIV. And there's been a few hypotheses of, of potentially why people living with HIV might uh, be seeing more hospitalizations than their non-HIV counterparts. And some of that has to do with potentially uh, folks living with HIV, particularly those with um, you know, uh, immunocompromised conditions or their immune system not functioning as well uh, may succumb to more severe manifestations of, of the monkeypox outbreak than their non-HIV counterparts. Um, and it's important to note that this has been seen, again, in some studies in, in Europe, uh, but in the general sort of HIV, uh, population of people living with HIV, they do not seem to be at higher risk of sort of severe outcomes um, compared to non-HIV folks. Okay, so you kind of answered my next question. Do, does having HIV uh, impact uh, your response to, to monkeypox if your immune system is compromised? Yeah, so I, I think it, it, it's a bit uh, it's a bit more nuanced than just if you're HIV positive or, or not. Uh, it's really folks living with HIV that have you know immune systems that are not functioning as well or um, HIV that's not as well controlled. We know that they're at risk for other complications, just like we saw with COVID. That COVID doesn't impact all people living with HIV the same way. That we see that COVID causes potentially more severe illness in those who have uncontrolled HIV or HIV that has impacted their immune system in a severe kind of way. And that's the same thing that we're seeing playing out with monkeypox currently. And uh, you, you mentioned the communities where monkeypox is more prevalent. Uh, are these communities able to get care? Do they have enough access to care? Yeah, I think that's the other um, sort of hypothesis of why we may be seeing uh, potentially more sort of severe cases of hospitalizations in people living with HIV. Uh, we know that people, uh, you know, when we think about people living with HIV, it's often folks who have more access to care or are engaged in care and therefore might be able to get access to testing easier or access to hospitalization if needed uh, uh, easier, uh, potentially in an easier basis. But we know that these um, these sort of access metrics are, are oftentimes informed by a lot of other social determinants uh, that really impact the overall care of, of, of anyone living in Chicago, not just those living with HIV or those at risk of monkeypox virus. And you have uh, a lot of places like the Center on Halstead, Howard Brown uh, in Chicago. Uh, are public health officials doing enough here to link people to care? I think there's been a huge push to make sure that we identify, you know, the communities who are at risk, the more vulnerable communities or marginalized communities, and making sure that they have access to not only, you know, interventions, but also knowledge and education of how to protect themselves. And I do think Chicago has been doing a, 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 a you know, on par with other major metropolitan cities in the United States, uh, making sure that these communities are aware of what's been going on and making sure that they're aware of what access to resources they have to protect themselves. Expanding out, uh, has the globe, uh, has the country, ha has the Chicago area seen its peak in monkeypox infections, or is it still on the rise? I think most of us uh, are cautiously optimistic with how the curve has been looking. For the past several weeks in a row, about four to five weeks in a row now, we've been seeing ongoing declines in overall cases of monkeypox virus. That's both, you know, globally, but also nationally and locally in Chicago. But I think that also can, can sometimes blur the picture that while we're seeing overall cases, go down, we're seeing proportions of cases increase in certain populations. And particularly among African American and Latino Latinx populations, we are seeing sort of slight increases in actual monkeypox numbers. So while globally we might be seeing cases go down, that sometimes kind of blurs the overall picture of how this epidemic is kind of shifting away from where we initially saw it. In fact, we have numbers that they illustrate that uh, from data earlier this month, uh, African Americans make up 23% of cases, Latino 27%. However, uh, black residents make up 12% in vaccine doses, Latino residents 21%. Uh, what do you think accounts for that disparity in vaccine rates? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think this goes back to thinking about, um, you know, it's multifactorial, right? So part of it is just vaccine confidence, um, uh, but the other part is just vaccine education, making sure people understand that these are available to them and they actually will protect them. You know, the fact that only, you know, we're seeing a huge disparity on who is, you know, getting monkeypox versus who is vaccinated is very, you know, um, uh, it jogs a lot of memory of what happened with COVID or what's been happening with COVID that we're seeing people, you know, populations impacted the most with COVID, the ones with the least vaccine uptake. And so again, a lot of our, a lot of our efforts around biomedical interventions and this type of counseling really has to be focused on the communities uh, that we're seeing sort of newer cases or rise in cases um, at this time. And so again, it's trying to match the epidemiology and, you know, public health has to remain nimble in order to do so. Part of this being, remember, in the 80s and 90s, there, there was a stigma around uh, HIV or AIDS uh, or any STI. Uh, could there be a stigma now around monkeypox, and could that prevent people from, from going and getting treatment? Yeah, I mean, I would argue that you know, HIV and STIs are still highly stigmatized in our society currently. Uh, and by extension, monkeypox beings, what we're seeing sexually transmitted or at least driven through sexual networks, um, sort of carrying that same type of stigma. I think that's hugely un, like counterproductive to the, what we're trying to do here in Chicago. And really, any, you know, any way we're thinking about messaging and thinking about our perspective on monkeypox has to be in the lens of dismantling stigma around us, normalizing screening, normalizing sort of testing and treatment, and making sure that folks realize that getting vaccinated, recognizing if they're in a risk group, and making sure they have access to vaccines is, is important. Uh, but again, I think I think stigma plays a huge role in here, and particularly when we think about intersexual identities, specifically around black and brown folks uh, who may identify as gay, queer, MSM, etc. Uh, that adds another layer of stigma that we need to be able to really understand and really think about when we're forming our sort of interventions and counseling around or resources around monkeypox. All right, a lot to keep in mind, and our thanks as always to Dr. Ani Hazra. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for having me again. And we're back with more Chicago tonight right after this. But first, we take a look at the weather. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. A new report finds black workers are overrepresented in low-wage roles. According to an analysis by the Shriver Center on Poverty Law, black women make up 6% of employed workers, but 32% of home health aides where they earn an average of around $23,000 a year. Black men also make up 6% of employed workers, but 15% of laborers in freight, stock, and material movers, and earn an average of around $27,000 a year. The report also says these workers struggle with not just low wages, but a lack of benefits, insufficient safety protections, and job security. On Chicago Tonight Black Voices, we recently spoke with the Shriver Center's president, as well as the president of Women Employed. I began by asking what some of the reasons are for the overrepresentation of black workers in these low-wage jobs. So first and foremost at the Shriver Center, we always talk about the fact that economic justice is a racial justice issue. The, although workers of color have historically been marginalized into low-wage, low-skill jobs, the growth of the gig industry, which is referring to independent contractors or freelancers that are doing short-term or temporary work, has actually worsened this trend. And this growth in gig work has led to a rampant misclassification of employees, many of whom would otherwise be entitled to significant benefits and protections as independent contractors. And those are individuals who are entitled to almost no protections. So this is a very serious issue, and we see an overrepresentation. For example, 40% of the Chicago metropolitan area um, is Black and Latinx, but yet 85% of the area's blue-collar temp work assignments go to Black and Latinx. So uh, racial justice is forefront when we're talking about economic justice, and that's the, what was the focus of the report that you mentioned. Sharita Ellens, what job categories are black women most underrepresented in, uh, and are there industries that have a wider pay gap than others? Um, so typically what you'll find are black women are um, segregated, because we use those term occupational segregation, into roles where they're low wages, 
um, and often in roles where they're only earning, well, they're earning a subminimum tip wage. And so that's going to be the direct care services that definitely that Audra spoke about, but service oriented jobs such as food services, other health care support jobs such as CNAs, nursing assistants, um, caregiving roles. Uh, they're also in child care, but not in teacher roles in educate in, in more educated uh, roles, but in teacher assistant roles where the pay gap is pretty low and other in retail and other supportive services. Um, and you know what's unique is that even if even while they are in roles uh, where you require a degree, even in those roles, they are still underpaid. So it's, it's an issue around um, low wage work, but it's an issue overall for, for black women as a whole. Audra, what, if anything, would you say is the relationship uh, between this current labor market, right? We've got the great resignation um, and a labor market where employers say they're struggling to find workers. What's the relationship between that market uh, and the reliance on lower wage gig workers? Well, for many employers, it's, it's more expedient quite frankly, to, to be able to rely upon gig workers, to not have to pay benefits, um, knowing that especially the population that we're talking about, um, there is more flexibility, obviously, in gig work, which is why many people pursue that. Um, and so employers have a benefit because they feel like they're paying less money um, to those. They don't have to pay benefits. They don't have to pay um, certain kinds of wages. Um, but obviously, this is why we are advocating for these sorts of protections, because we recognize as the, this industry is proliferating, that it, ultimately it's going to do a lot of even more damage to this population of workers. Um, and interestingly, for employers to, to not to try to avoid paying benefits is extraordinarily short-sighted, because what ends up happening is you have high turnover, you, when you don't offer benefits, you have people who are now are not able to avail themselves of sick leave, which was very important during the pandemic. Um, it, it's really a very short-sighted move for employers to not be thinking of making investments in their workers. But at least on the front end, it would seem to be more um, safe cost savings for them. Sharita Allen's recently efforts to unionize some sectors of employment have, have bloomed, really. Uh, can that help with closing the, the pay gap for black women? Absolutely. Um, we know that um, workers that are part of a union are paid more. We know that women who have the benefit of being represented by uh, a union see even a larger difference than most. So in Illinois, um, union membership increases uh, hourly earner earnings by 14.7%. Um, and for Black women, uh, that are a part of a union, they're making 23 more percent than black women who are not in a union. So this is, this is one of those things that we know that we need to continue to protect and continue to fight for the right for workers to unionize. And we know that there is also a push for those protections to be stripped away. Um, and, and a lot of that is because, right, you have someone there that's helping to negotiate your salary on your behalf through collective bargaining. You have a place to go to when you have a formal grievance um, where you're and, and you're represent and you are um, protected by union representation. And that just doesn't exist um, most of the time outside of union. Audra, uh, the city recently announced that its uh, guaranteed income pilot is now fully enrolled. We know that Cook County is, is taking uh, large steps towards uh, launching its program, which will be even bigger, considered uh, possibly the biggest in the nation. Um, and with regards to the low-wage workers that you all surveyed for your report, how much could continuing uh, a guaranteed income program help? Very, very much so. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned the fact that um, with the dual pilots, this makes both Chicago and Cook County, we are the, the second most populous county and the third largest city in the country that are launching pilots simultaneously. So the country is actually going to be watching to see you know, the impact of this program, and we know that it's going to have extraordinary benefits. In the so Chicago pilot alone, there is, um, I don't want to say an overrepresentation of women, but it's over 60%, actually you know, nearly 70%, because many of them are heads of household. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing the trend and the impact on black women specifically. But um, we know that collectively these pilots are going to be able to help many people. I should say, though, that um, I've, I've spoken to others who think, well, is this enough money or 
um, what more can we do? Uh, and I always remind them two things. Number one, obviously, any amount of money that we're able to give in a terms of a subsidy that people are going to be able to use in the way that best suits their families is a very positive thing. But secondly, it does not preclude the conversation we must continue to have about paying people what they are worth. So we still need to be thinking about paying livable wages. We still need to so, be thinking about making sure people have benefits. Sounds like you're advo advocating for a both and rather than an either or. Uh, that's where we'll have to leave it. Ardra Wilson and Sharita Ellen. Thanks to you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Back with more Chicago Tonight right after this. Little Village is home to one of Chicago's youngest populations. 30% of La Villita residents are under the age of 20. But those young people can have a hard time finding places in the neighborhood where they're welcome to just hang out. A new spot on 26th Street wants to rope in those young Chicagoans by offering them a freshly fried twist on a Mexican tradition. Producer Erica Gunderson loops us in at El Churro Shop. Churro is what we call a parachuto, which is very classical, which is just butter, flour, sugar, water. It's made multiple times a day, and we never refrigerate it, and we never freeze it, and we never hold it overnight. It's not hard. It's just, just looking at the batter, and the batter tells you when to stop. Born in Spain, perfected in Mexico, churros, the crispy fried sugar kiss dough sticks, are a familiar indulgence to many. Crunchy outside, soft center, golden brown, and delicious. But even on 26th Street, churros fresh from the fryer are a rarity. Here at El Churro Shop, owner and little village native Aldo Rios is taking the sweet snack back to its Mexican roots. A lot of people grew up with the idea of what a churro should be, is stuffed. Traditionally, it was made by hand, it was made fresh, it was fried though, and it wasn't really stuffed. Rather than filling his churros, Rios offers house-made sauces and toppings to add adventure to his traditional treats. We have our own chocolate with Choco Krispies, or we have a strawberry sauce, which is on the sweet side, with a coconut. We have a salted caramel, and then a really neat one is like a dulce de leche with mazapan. Before opening El Churro Shop in July, Rios had worked in kitchens for his entire professional life. When the pandemic shutdowns caused his hours to be cut in 2020, Rio suddenly had one crucial ingredient that he had always been short on before, time. It gave me enough time to think of something that I could do on my own. Uh, and for some reason, churros came up. Rios developed a recipe and set up a deep fryer on the sidewalk at 26th in St. Louis, where he discovered the old way of making churros was new to many little village residents. People started coming up, they really didn't know what I was doing. They thought I was frying fish for some reason. Uh, once they saw that I was actually making churros, seeing it being made by hand with a piping and scissors and cutting it and fried to order, I was like, wow, is that really how you make a churro? I'm like, yeah, that's exactly how it is. Not long after, Rios also began making churros in pop-ups and at private events. But even though people loved his product, he says opening a brick and mortar shop didn't occur to him until. Me and my wife one day were just driving up and down 26th Street, wanting a place to sit down, have coffee, just like, just have a conversation and just hang out, to be honest. Um, and we didn't find that. We didn't have a really space that, that we could actually do that. It wasn't really like the intention, but we saw the lack of in the neighborhood and we pursued it. Now, Rios hopes he's found the secret sauce for success by creating a place for community in Little Village. Everybody is welcome to come in, sit down, have a conversation. If you have no internet at home, you're welcome to, to use it here, have your computer, work on an assignment, do research, whatever it is, and enjoy a hot beverage, enjoy a churro, enjoy something that like, we're trying to present culturally, uh, traditionally. We have a young crowd here, and let's keep them here, let's keep them in the neighborhood. And, there's plenty of potential to do a lot of stuff and keep it within the neighborhood and keep it ours. For Chicago Tonight, this is Erica Gunderson. Churros aren't the only dough getting the hot oil treatment at El Churro Shop. They also fry up an American classic, funnel cakes. You'll find more about El Churro Shop on our website. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols.
the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. We've made it. Justice Jackson's appointment to the Supreme Court provides the beacon of hope. Black women are underrepresented. We still rise. We still show up for one another. It's us investing in the next generation and giving them something to enrich the next generation with. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. City Council considers banning police from cooperating with investigations into those seeking abortions. And our Spotlight Politics team on the mayor's pick to lead the 43rd Ward. Much more. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago. <laughs>